As we speak, Florida in the U.S. is counting the cost of another violent hurricane. It's one of the latest weather events scientists are warning will become more frequent and more severe. Of course, we're also familiar with extreme weather here, which is a stark reminder of the need to end our reliance on fossil fuels. Derek takes a fresh look at an alternative. It has pride of place in the prestigious Santon Mile, surrounded by big-name law firms, auditors and insurers. Listed on the Joburg and New York stock exchanges and employing more than 30,000 people globally, Sassel is one of the country's biggest corporate taxpayers. It's the sleek corporate face of an enterprise that built its success in much bleaker surroundings in a town that bears its name. This is Sassel's first coal-to-liquid plant built in Sasselberg in the mid-50s. It was leading fuel production technology at the time, but this was an era when pollution control wasn't a high priority. But that was then. This is now. Climate change. Climate change. Climate change. Some coastal areas are already struggling. Things were getting worse. Crises, including wars, including food shortages. The past nine years were the hottest on record, and the Earth's surface is more than a degree hotter than at the start of the 20th century. We simply must end our reliance on fossil fuels. But is anything being done about it in places like this? Dr. Ian Cruikshank is living the green life on his plot outside Johannesburg. Half of his plot is left completely undisturbed, a haven for urban wildlife and insects. It's the perfect home office for a man whose day job is all about making better choices for the environment and helping others to do the same. There is a lot of chaos and confusion. There's so many different technologies. Um, and so it becomes a little difficult to figure out which one is real, which one has potential, or which ones are just pie in the sky. Dr. Cruikshank is an environmental and transportation specialist. For more than a decade, he's been involved in what's known as biofuel. In that time, he's worked with the Global Airline Association, IATA, as well as aircraft manufacturer Boeing, and our own national carrier. I work quite extensively with SAA, where we developed an entire biofuel program from scratch. And powered only with biofuel, SAA flew from Johannesburg to Cape Town without a hiccup. No mean feat when you consider where it comes from. Biofuel can be produced from virtually any organic material, so after frying your chips, this can be used to power an aircraft, a truck, or even your SUV. Right now, used cooking oil is the main raw material used to manufacture biofuel. But it can be made from almost any organic material. These ingredients are called feedstocks. But that groundbreaking SAA flight was seven years ago, and despite their promise, biofuels appear to have fallen off the radar. At this stage, we are not really making any biofuel at all. We already have blending mandates in this country that says we have to blend some sustainable biofuels in with fuel, but nobody does it because there is no product available. Regulations drawn up 15 years ago stipulate that all diesel in South Africa should be blended with at least 2.5% biofuel. That's all well and good when there's enough being made. There is a big outflow of our used oils to Europe due to the massive demand created by their policies to meet renewable energy targets. In 2020, Europe's biofuel consumption just for transport totaled close to a whopping 16 million metric tons. Kauteng's I Live is one of the few local producers of biofuel, and they've been making it for five years. Werner Euler is co-owner. The biodiesel has the potential to reduce greenhouse gas emissions between 80 to 90 percent compared to fossil fuels if we do a direct replacement of fossil fuels. 
We catch up with Werner in the Dutch capital Amsterdam, where he's working with international partners on ways to expand biofuel in South Africa beyond just used cooking oil. It's a potential source or feedstock which has the potential to solve two problems. But invasive alien plants have grown to a problem which is out of proportion. Invasive alien plants are a bigger problem than you might realize. They are considered a threat to indigenous biodiversity and human livelihoods and cost the country tens of billions each year in management and lost agricultural productivity. And harvesting and eradicating this over the next 20 years and converting this into to biomass or biofuels uh, will have a major spin-off for the country. For example, it translates into 1.5 billion litres per annum of biofuels. That's 30% of South Africa's diesel demand. Ferdinand's plans could be a significant step forward. But not everyone's convinced. Greenpeace Africa were of the opinion that if there is a role for biofuels, it's um, quite a limited one. Tandile Chinyanvanu is from global campaigning network Greenpeace. She says while biofuels are getting good press, there's a significant downside. There is better uses for land than potentially using it for um, cultivating biofuels. Many environmental groups agree, arguing food-based biofuels like corn for ethanol and soy for biodiesel destroy native habitats and, ironically, worsen the climate crisis. The dichotomy between fueling the country's energy needs and protecting the environment can these two ever meet? Greenpeace Africa has campaigned extensively on renewable energy and the potential that it has in meeting our social justice needs, but also to reduce our emissions as a part of our climate commitments. What if biofuel production ticks all the boxes? We would need to ensure that it is met with a robust regulatory framework that can ensure that those environmental injustices, social injustices do not occur. Framework or no framework, Vernon and his colleagues are pushing ahead. ILIV has recently finished building a massive plant in Kabacha in the Eastern Cape to convert biomass into pellets that can be used to generate cleaner electricity or processed to make biofuels. One extraordinary advantage is that we have an existing technology and refineries uh, in South Africa which can produce advanced fuels or power to X fuels. And that brings us back to Sassel. South Africa is already the global leader converting carbon or coal into liquid fuels. And the same technology could be used to produce biofuels. Simply put, Sassel makes the petrol and diesel we buy by squeezing liquid fuel from coal in the same way that Werner's recycled pellets can be compressed to make biofuel. The question is whether there's an appetite to make the switch. You can't be proud of headlines like this, uh, the world's biggest emitter of greenhouse gases. Sassel's business is about converting coal to synthetic fuels and chemicals. And in the process of that conversion, we are naturally a large uh, greenhouse gas emitter. Sassel meets close to 30% of the country's fuel needs, running into tens of billions of litres. It's made the company a world leader in coal to liquid technology and a polluter on a grand scale. It's an unenviable reputation and one Dr. Surashan Pillay is charged with cleaning up. The present plants have the technology uh, to manufacture biofuels, is that correct? Today we get that carbon and hydrogen from coal and natural gas. But in the future, those same plants can be repurposed to then um, use sustainable uh, feedstocks like green hydrogen, sustainable carbon, to then produce sustainable fuels and chemicals. When it comes to going green, it seems Sassel has something a little different in mind. The real advantage for South Africa is to use green hydrogen then to decarbonize other sectors of the economy. Hydrogen is the H in H2O. It's a widely used fuel that's generated by splitting it from the oxygen in water using electricity. It's no help to climate change if that electricity is generated by burning fossil fuels. Making green hydrogen requires sustainable sources like wind and solar power. We could add up to 370,000 jobs in the country. It really is a fantastic opportunity and it's something that we together with our partners are looking at capitalizing.
But if you believe that signals a rapid shift by a coal-hungry megapolluter, think again. We still see that coal has a future to play and, and, and quite a big role to play in our future. We see a gradual tapering of uh, coal into the future. Sassel aims for zero emission status in 28 years time. There's no reason that South Africa can't become a regional powerhouse when it comes to the production of fuel. Imagine the biggest single point emitter of greenhouse gas in the entire world now becoming one of the leading third generation biofuels producer. I think that is what we're all waiting for. Thanks for watching. Why not drop us a comment below? We love reading your opinions. Remember, you can now access carte blanche stories anytime, anywhere even offline. Carte Blanche, the podcast, is now available on all major podcast platforms. So be sure to hit that follow or subscribe button and be part of our growing online family.